Thank you very much, and thank you especially for our um, library, library and to give me this opportunity to sort of share with you my research here at uh, University of New Haven. Um, so every time you know I get to the library, I feel a little bit overwhelmed because so many books. When I'm going to finish reading all this, right? <laughs> and um, so, but I, re I clearly remember that when I was uh, working so hard at doing my PhD, say five years, and then I got my thesis, right? So I'm so proud, and then I gave that to my advisor, and then he put it stuck to the bookshelf. See, that's another <laughs> thesis. So uh, truly is that we are um, humble in a way that as human beings because uh, many generations of scientists, researchers before us, you know, thousands of years, has accumulated all this knowledge. So uh, also we are sort of honored in, in, in a sense is we're equipped, you know, for, for you as an undergrad or graduate student, and be, you've been educated in, in college, in university, and you've been given the opportunity to sort of equip you with the knowledge, then you can discover new things. You can make new things, so that you can ask something to the library, right? So I think, I, I hope that my talk will sort of try to share my experience and hope to inspire you to contribute your stuff to mankind, because I really feel it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great business. It's a always feeling uh, fulfilling and satisfied uh, business, and I always tell my student it's better than doing something else on a Saturday. It's, it's, it's doing research is something I really like to do. All right, so I'm going to share with you about the discovery of a uh, drive the discovery of a green catalyst for biomass conversion using inverse molecular design. So by definition, I'm really a theoretical computational uh, chemist, just like Pauline, and we are. We're interested in using the theoretical and computational tools to solve important problems in experiment. In this case, I mean, I'm really interested in solve for these biomass catalyst design problem. And I, because I'm the theoretical guy, and I need some, you know, experimental collaborators. So it's great that we have uh, people at Yale who's interested in collaborating with us. We have uh, Paul Anastas. He's sort of the founding father for green chemistry. He wrote a book of uh, green principle of green chemistry. And also have uh, two very nice uh, people. Uh, Lorraine, she's a PhD student right now at Yale, and Ivan was the uh, lab manager and also sort of a uh, research scientist in the library. And in our side, we actually have very good people, uh, Rafael and Amanda, some of you might recognize these two people. They already graduated, uh, they're in, I think they're majoring in chemistry and also probably double majoring in forensic science. Uh, they made tremendous contribution to these uh, work that I'm going to present. So first, we're going to talk about, since we're looking for biomass conversion, we're looking for new catalysts to do uh, biomass conversion. The first thing I want to talk with you is about these uh, fossil fuels, the energies. Uh, so the fossil fuel, we all know that it's going gonna, it's gonna to end some point because it's not a renewable energy form. But the mystery is nobody can predict when it's going to end, right? So it's probably in 200 years, probably in 300 years, who knows? And some people are going to predict uh, we're right here, we're going to at the peak position of the uh, fossil fuel. So, uh, but it's hard to predict, but as scientists, we all understand that it will end someday. It could be 500 years, 200 years. We better think something. Uh, before we approach to that point. I think the most important thing is not just about the re energy form, but the, the resource and energy we need is also the economic and the social uh, uh, sort of uh, requirement for us to do so. Because think about it, when you, we're getting less and less oil, say from Middle East or from US, we got all the social uh, problems. People, people feel that we're paying too much for the gasoline and then you will have uh, other industries suffer from these needs as well. So really getting renewable energy is not saying we are, we worry too much uh, for you know, something gonna happen in 200 years. It will be something you're gonna see very quickly. And we have saw that already, you know, last, uh, the, the few months ago, the price was really high and then drop, right? So now, if you look at the, all these uh, renewable energy forms, uh, we actually have uh, different kinds of renewable energy. Uh, we have a uh, hydropower, it's about 31% of the renewable energy. So the overall renewable energy is only 8% of the overall energy consumption. So renewable energy is really have a great room to grow. Uh, if you look at these renewable energy, you have a hydropower, 31%, wood is about 25%, which is kind of the we're burning wood, so this is a traditional way to generate energy. And the biofuel is about 23%, and then biomass waste is about 6%, wind 11%. Everybody talk about solar, and solar is only 1% of renewable energy. 
So really that those energy forms it has a tremendous way to grow to fulfill the needs of the uh, energy consumption needs of the earth. Now when we talk about biomass, uh, Eddie been know this because uh, when we talk about biomass we're not interested to uh, use sort of food uh, to convert it to biomass which is already being applied. When you go to the gasoline station they would say we have a 10% uh, ethanol and those usually coming from the uh, sugarcane or uh, corn um, industry and then they do the fermentation and then they get the uh, ethanol out of it and then they add it to your gasoline. It's a one way to go but it's going to compete with the food industry so especially think about well we're lucky in America that everybody has been fed pretty well we have you know enough money to buy food but you know in uh, Africa and other places people are actually starving so we have to uh, think about better solution for these biofuels. And so we're really interested in some kind of non-food biomass you can think of is like the dry crops, rice in the farms. Uh, each summer, you, you know, after harvest, you, you got plenty of this. I know in China, people actually have nowhere to dispose this, they just burn it. It creates this air pollution in one time, I remember, uh, because we're in the southwestern part of China, and because it's a basin area, when they burn it, even the airplane cannot fly. Uh, so it's it really if we can use those as an energy resource and that will be one way to solve the pollution uh, problem or even though, even though it's a seasonal pollution problem and also can convert something to a very useful resource. And also you see that's a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, we say dying woods and this woods is you know, every time you got a hurricane, you got something, you know, fell down. Uh, sometimes I talk to my son, we usually do jogging in the East Iraq and say, you don't exercise? Uh, that's the you know this is the tree that don't exercise, <laughs> right? Uh, but of course I'm joking. So uh, the thing is uh, that this is the we we ha we got to look at those. There's a plenty of those uh, sort of dying woods, and also you know the paper boards. You know we have plenty when we uh, daily life. So if you add up all these non-food biomass, is if you convert all this to oil, is about 3.8 10 to the ninth barrel oil. And think about the United States, we convert about twice that size of a barrel oil. So which means if you convert all the non-food biomass, if it's going to be half the oil consumption of the United States. And that is significant because that will release our burden relying on the import of uh, oil from Middle East and other, other places and probably resolve a little bit the political issues we have with the Middle East. Now, and also for the landfill biomass, uh, which is, I believe is great, is, is not, even though it seems like we're still converted to oil and we're burning it, going to generate carbon dioxide. But you think about a whole cycle of biomass, you're not generating any extra amount of carbon dioxide. Um, so, because of when you convert, this, say, the biomass uh, from the pl uh, green plants converted to, say, uh, dry crops, and uh, then you convert that to oil and you burn it, generate carbon dioxide, but Mother Nature can take care of it because when, well, the green plants can absorb carbon dioxide and then convert it to oxygen and then uh, sort of uh, have the recycle of the carbon. So the whole cycle of these biomass, you're not going to supposed to see sort of extra amount of CO2 being released, which is different from fossil fuel because fossil fuel, when you burn it, you're going to generate all this uh, carbon dioxide. You're not going to have a way to recycle it, right? So. Oh, so that is uh, why we think the biomass is actually a renewable energy form. Now, we talk about all the great things about mass. It seems to everybody agree. This is a g good uh, resource of energy that we should look for. Uh, we should look at ways to solve it. But the question is, how do you solve it? Because uh, biomass, you learn in the old days, probably, you know, people have been using that for a thousand years. You just take wood and burn it and you can cook. Uh, that's one way to use sort of biomass uh, renewable energy. And then um, now people really for the industry right now if you want to convert that to something like gasoline and uh, one way that other than the first generation, the, the sugar canes, uh, the federal check, second generation we're really looking for catalysts, a good catalyst, cheap robust catalyst to do the trick. And so these catalysts can convert this biomass quickly to uh, oil. Now when we talk about this, this is sort of connecting to the overall uh, goal of uh, green chemistry. So the green chemistry is an area of chemistry that focuses on the design of products and process that minimize the use or generation of hazardous substance. Because in you know environmental production in the old days, 
is saying we we know we mess up. You know, we know we mess up. Like in China, they they cannot stop messing up the air and 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 uh, environment because they say because people need to feed themselves. So we have to have the polluted industry. We have no other way. So when they polluted those environment, and then they say we're going to figure a way. You know, they're going to rely on the chemists and say think some smart way to, to, to fix the problem. But the green chemistry is saying, why don't we start from the beginning? We start the beginning saying we have these sort of benign materials. We know it's not going to be harmful to the environment. And then we start from there, then we don't have to worry about cleaning the mess uh, at the end. So for the, I think this is a fantastic idea. I mean, of course, there's a lot of challenges because of the, we know as chemists, a lot of things so convenient and work so well, but suddenly you change the grain, you won't work that well. So you have to find a better way. So for me, green chemistry is not about saying you shouldn't use this, you shouldn't use that. It's not a constraint. In fact, it should be the innovation. I mean, this is all Paul's talk, been talking uh, in his conference. I mean, I've been to, and he's saying that the green chemistry is about innovation. You have to come something smarter that uh, can do better. So, uh, so in response to this, we in my laboratory we have sort of call uh, inverse molecular design methodology which I'm going to talk about a little bit um, in detail later. Uh, basically, it's a new computational tour, sort of a new development in the recent years in, in quantum chemistry regime. And then we're going to adapt that methodology. Uh, basically, we're going to climb some kind of structure. Uh, this is a structure and prop the hyperspace uh, for the catalyst. And then we reach to the top of the mountain and say, this is the best catalyst. And we're going to identify what is that best catalyst. And then we're going to use that to convert uh, biomass to oil. Now, before we do that, well, let's get to, first get to, as a chemist, all oh, love to see molecular structures. We're going to see what is the molecular structures involved in the, all these biomass. Uh, so we know there's a three different kinds of polymers in biomass. The one is called um, cellulose. I mean, this is a high uh, percentage. It's a kind of crystal, crystalline structure. So you have a 40% to 50%. And then you look at, there's another type, it's called uh, hemicellulose. And this is a little less rigid, uh, you know, and this is about 25 to 35 percent. And then you also have another thing, it's called liglin. So liglin is a relatively smaller uh, molecule, but it's still, you know, considered to be polymer. But this is much rigid, uh, but probably not a crystal-like structure. And this is, this is a lot of aromatic uh, link, um, um, moieties uh, linked by uh, ether groups. So for Cellulose and hemicellulose, you probably can do the use water, sort of break it, uh, the bond easily. But ligalin is really hard to break the uh, linkage between different groups. So we're going to focus on the break, breaking the bonds in ligalins. So here is the structure of ligalin. Um, you can see that we actually have uh, aromatic uh, ether. So this is the um, you know, phenarene here, phenarene here, connecting with the oxygen. So, you know, rem recall that that's the ether bond. And then also we have a lot of uh, methoxyl groups. So you have uh, methyl groups connecting with the oxygen and then connecting with the aromatic uh, groups. So also OH groups, and this is another um, ether group right here. And you may also have the aromatic rings. So the point is, if you, this is, you know, this is, I just take a f one fragment of ligalin. So think about how you're going to break it. Uh, you're going to first you have to break the COC bond with the ether bond. And also, you, in, in order to get the uh, high ratio of uh, hydrogen and carbon, which means you want to really re remove oxygen because you, you put too much oxygen, oxygen when you burn it, isn't the, 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 the calorie is going to be really low. So, really, you wanted to have a, wall, a few that with less oxygen content. So also we need to remove all these oxygen contents. So that is the main two tasks. I mean, the first is you break these link COC linkage. And the second is you have to remove all the oxygens. So in, in order to enhance these um, uh, capacity of the fuel. So now if you look at the catalyst that people have been uh, using so far, I mean, I'm talking about like there's probably different ways to do the uh, catalytic um, uh, breaking down of the liquid. So I'm particularly interested in the hydrogenation uh, uh, catalytic uh, reactions. So you use hydrogen, you pass hydrogen through all these biomass, and then the hydrogen will actually break down all these liquid uh, bio, uh, biopolymers and lead to very small pieces. So for in this area, people are actually looking at you know precious metals to try uh, precious metals and also try these earth abundant metals. So for the precious metals, they find out 
usually those meadows work at relatively, um, I would say, mild temperatures. Still, the temperature is relatively high. It's around 200 degrees C. And then they also need the relatively high hydrogen pressure because you pass hydrogen through this biomass and you need the, a certain pressure of the hydrogen, otherwise the hydrogen would not stick to your biomass. So you need a pretty high pressure so they have a re really good uh, concentration of the hydrogen. So that usually the hydrogen pressure is about 40 bar, I would say 30 to 40 bar. So you know one bar is room atmospheric uh, uh, pressure. So it's about 40 times of the room uh, pressure. Now, if you look at the earth abundant metals, which is like uh, copper, uh, iron, and all these, so these are sort of called cheap metals. And cheap metals, they can do the trick as well, but usually the temperature is much higher. It's going to be 300 to 400 degrees C. All right, and then uh, the pressure is also going to be much higher. It's going to be 100, 200 bar. So this is 200 times higher than the uh, uh, room pressure. So, of, of course, the, the drawback for the precious metal is too expensive. You know, from the green chemistry point of view, we really want everybody to use uh, sort of the cheap metals to replace uh, these noble metals or precious metals. But the question is how? If you replace it, you're going to lower the activity. Oh, of course, you already see from these empirical um, uh, results here. So now, this is the, th I, I believe it's really the, the challenge for uh, green chemistry we have to solve it. I mean, uh, that's something I believe the inverse design that we're contributing to that part. All right, so the first thing we want to look at is, now we know all these, uh, we need a high uh, pressure, you know, for precious metals, 30 to 40 bar, you know, for uh, non-precious metals, probably 100 to uh, 200 bar. So the, po the point is, can we actually do hydrogenation under relatively mild conditions, say around the room temperature and room pressure, and possibly you, you can use like water, which water is sort of the most benign solvent, right? It's everywhere. So you're not, you don't have to rely on the sort of uh, very non-polar organic solvent because eventually, at the end you're going to think about how to recycle and not to pollute the environment. So I, I think the first question for me when we uh, sort of uh, look at these design problems is try to figure out if it's theoretically possible to actually use hydrogen to break down all these ligalin bonds at uh, sort of near room temperature, room pressure, and grain solvents. So the first thing we do is we take a few uh, model compounds. These model compounds, we have the functional groups that are embedded in this ligalin. And because the reason you want to have model compound because you, you throw ligalin to your experiment, then at the end you're going to have a big mess. And then it's hard to study. So we're going to study, say, for example, uh, we have the vanillin here, uh, right here, and then we have some uh, eugenol. So these groups, you have the sort of unsaturated double bond, you have the carbonyl groups, you have these uh, ether groups, and also you have the aromatic ring. So we're going to look at, we'll put, put a hydrogen in and see uh, how those bonds will, will change. Well, so we're particularly looking at, say, uh, the saturation of these carbonyls and, and double bonds and also the aromatic rings. We're also looking at the breakdown of these uh, ketone bonds and uh, ether bonds, OH groups, and the uh, aromatic ether groups. So we have to think, look at all these reactions, sort of uh, the breakdown reactions and also the saturation reactions. Now here, if you recall, when you guys, you know, the, the students who, in the audience, when you take my PCHEM class, you know, we talk about the, you know, uh, Gibbs free energy, right? So, so Gibbs, so when we say if, if the process is feasible or not, and it depends on Gibbs free energy, right? So here's the question. For the Gibbs energy, uh, it, should Gibbs energy be positive or negative in order to have a spontaneous process? Negative. negative. That's right. Okay. Good. You, at least you get passed for the first exam for, <laughs> of the PCHEM class, right? So, all right. Now, so this is, you know, for quantum chemistry, we can do any calculation, you know, uh, for uh, thermodynamics. So we're computing these uh, Gibbs free energy for uh, these uh, sort of uh, hydrogenation of three bonds here, three groups here, and then we do the hydrogenolysis, which is breaking all those four bonds, and we look at the Gibbs free energy. Now, we we'll first plot this Gibbs energy, which is this co uh, color coded by here. Uh, you can see, for example, this blue color, it's uh, A, and then all the way to 16. So this is the uh, kcal per mole um, for Gibbs energy. 
and then this is for the first functional group and you see all, in all this region of uh, 0 to 300 degrees C and then 0, 1 bar to 60 bar for hydrogen pressure and we find out this Gibbs energy is actually uh, positive all right so which means this would this would, would this uh, process happen or not well, would this reaction happen or not when you have a positive delta G it won't, it won't. okay so which means you cannot do the saturation of carbon new all right uh, well, for, for aldehyde now if you look at another one which is the number three which is the aromatic ring so you put an aromatic ring you put a hydrogen in and then you look at the Gibbs energy you see also positive so which means supposedly in this temperature range from 0 to 301 to 60 bar and I cannot break down the aromatic ring by using hydrogen okay but any other reaction actually possible so you can actually see breaking down the CO C bond is possible removing the OH is possible uh, break down the C carbon CO double bond is possible also remove the OH group from the aromatic ring is possible which is excellent because uh, that's what we're looking for uh, because this whole regime here including the temperature you know 25 degrees C and also including the one bar uh, room pressure so which means that those uh, temperature and those pressure I shall be able to break the COC bond, COC bond and also remove the oxygen content which is fantastic and also I remain the aromatic ring uh, if I wanted to keep the aromatic uh, structure and I can do it all right now the second thing is we wanted to introduce solvent because we know solvent is a factor to influence these thermodynamics as well. So now this y-axis is representing the dielectric constant of the solvent from 0 to 80. Now 80 is water. So 0, you know, it's, uh, it's sort of vacuum, right? So um, and then from 1 uh, all the way to 80, that is uh, the whole range of dielectric constant. You're going to have organic, uh, different, you know, polar, non-polar solvents. So we look at all these uh, dielectric constant change versus uh, its influence to these uh, uh, delta G, and we find out for F1 and F3 still uh, we're going to have a, del a positive delta G. So for the, so solvent does not influence much the delta G for these two uh, reactions. The still the aromatic you cannot break it and the carbonyl you cannot saturate it all right uh, and then for the rest you're going to still see even though you change the solvent reaction is still going to happen so which is excellent because we're really looking into the uh, solvent condition at 80 which is aqueous environment and see if that um, in, under such condition would the reaction happen or not and find out as it's possible now the, the last plot here is sort of because I, I try to make it more sort of comprehensive and we're going to use these uh, y-axis as my dielectric constant here. The pressure is my y-axis. In the previous slide, the s-axis is temperature. And once again, you see for 1 and 3, the, they're both, both positive. But for the rest, you're going to see that they're all negative. The great thing is uh, we're looking at those negative things, and we know that it will happen. So to summarize, we know by our thermodynamic calculation that under, you know, near these, uh, I would say, the global MIDAS condition, which is room temperature, room pressure, and water uh, solvent. And we find out that under such condition, and my, I can decompose ligulin by breaking the COC bond, and also I can saturate it uh, or remove the oxygen content. So that's, you know, that's, we give the phys sort of theoretical foundation. We say it is possible. Okay, now then you do a reality check, and you know when you add catalyst to it, the catalyst cannot change the thermodynamics. The catalyst can only change the kinetics or the activation energy. So when you look at different cat, or in other ways, the catalyst is just going to make your reaction a little bit faster. Okay, now you look at all the catalysts. This is sort of the uh, catalyst with these uh, uh, sort of cheap metals, and this is a the blue one is the catalyst with the or sort of a uh, noble metals or, or the expensive metals and you find out that none of those existing catalysts are actually approaching these sort of we define the mild conditions or the Midas conditions alright now but theoretically it's possible to get there so for that reason we define a regime we call that this is a sort of ideal catalyst regime we say if you can have a catalyst 
will make this reaction happen from 0 to 100 degrees C, which is the temperature of the, the steam. Um, and then um, you have a 1, 2, say 10 bar. Uh, under such uh, condition, if you can have a catalyst to fall into this regime, we call it ideal catalyst. And so this would have set up a goal for the, design, for the uh, molecular design field. And we actually submitted this paper to a special issue in green chemistry. Um, hopefully people are going to like it. Now, OK, when you do all these calculations, um, you also need to have a reality check. You know, when you do calculation, we know that the density function of theory in you know, the modern uh, quantum chemistry is, is really mature. A lot of calculation can be really accurate. But still, uh, you know, theory is still theory. You need, you need some reality check. So the reason we chose all these uh, organic compounds is because uh, our collaborator can do experiment, right? So, so they actually did experiment. And they will find out that, for example, the eugenol, uh, they, they use some kind of a copper catalyst. And then they find out these 95% uh, product will be the saturation of the double bond. And we actually predicted that as thermodynamically feasible. So they actually got 95%. So it's really high. And then uh, also, we predicted for the uh, saturation of the aromatic ring that's going to be forbidden. And they don't see any compound that can actually break the aromatic ring. So which also means it is consistent with our prediction. And the third thing is very interesting. We say break the, you know, remove the OH shall be visible and or, or break the COC bond, the ether bond shall be visible, but they don't see it. All right? So which means that these catalysts they're using is doing a trick. So that you know the catalyst has some uh, spe spe selectivity. All right. So, the, which means if something does not, you know, absorb to this surface, uh, it may not work. So we need to understand that as well. So the main, my main point is they did a lot of experiments, try to, you know, see if our calculation makes sense. In the meantime, our calculation actually helped them to understand their catalyst is highly selective for the hydrogenation of double bonds. So that paper also already been accepted in green chemistry. And I think Raphael is actually the main contributor from the uh, computational side for this work. All right, so I think the first part is really we build a foundation to say theoretically it's possible to sort of uh, decompose these biomass, uh, particularly ligalin, into small pieces using the hydrogenation reactions. All right. But then the second question is how, right? So how, uh, what, what catalyst that you, you're going to sort of invent as a new catalyst other than the existing sort of a very expensive or not so mild condition catalyst. So we are proposing to use these called the inverse molecular design. So the you know, molecular design problem is non trivial at all. You know, when people try to come up with a drug, like uh, uh, Labyrinth just told you before, we're actually doing you know, drug design as well. So the main point is, for all the organic molecules, molecular weigh lower than 500, all right, this is a relatively small molecule, and people actually estimate it, you're going to have 10 to the 200 possible molecules. So we're almost like you're fighting one needle in the ocean. Right? You're gonna, if you find one really good out of all these molecules, it's going to be really challenging. Of course, that which means it's also good news for the younger generation to say, you're never going to out of job. Right? <laughs> you never be out of job because uh, there's so many molecules out there, uh, even though we may find some drug already good, and you're going to find something better. Right? So, and they will, they, they will pay you. Right? OK, now for this uh, uh, design problem in terms of computational is saying, we have to compute, usually in a traditional way, say, I, I, had, I know I have to say one million molecules. I'm going to compute the, the, the catalytic efficiency, all the 100 molecules, and then, or uh, one million molecules, and find out which one is the best. But of course, in terms of competition, of cost, we know it's pretty high. And then you have no way to say, I know where to go in terms of searching be the best molecule. So what we propose, uh, called inverse design, is saying, uh, if I know, you can, have, you can create a surface between the property and the structure. Um, so instead of doing this random search, uh, we're actually using the gradient of your property versus the structure. And then this gradient, since it points you to the direction or uplift direction. 
So it's like you're, you're hunting a peak of a mountain and then you, you have some kind of meter that always tell you to go, where to go to the top, right? Once you get to the top, you know it's the top because the gradient is zero. That's right? So that's, that's how we think this is sort of a very attractive method. We actually, been, we actually proved that it had been very interesting, very useful for a couple of cases. Uh, so we actually, first we sort of, when, once you find out some kind of algorithm like that, first we have to define the problem mathematically. So if you're interested in reading more on this, I actually wrote a review and they published in the uh, Royal Society um, Specialist Periodic Report. Uh, in particular the issue for chemical modeling in 2014. So we actually define what is inverse molecular design problem because it's a relatively new concept. All right, so the, the real problem is saying you, you, what we're doing is, you know, we're, we're making something continuous, right? So um, Joseph may help us with this because this is really the mathematical problem. Saying you're going to have some kind of variable uh, which you can make it continuous uh, then when you change this continuous number, you're going to change the Hamiltonian. When you guys took a quantum, you know the Hamiltonian decided everything, right? So you can change the Hamiltonian. Once you change the Hamiltonian, then you're going to change the property, which is the O. So, the, so if you want some property like the catalytic efficiency to approach a desire, say I want some catalyst to happen at room temperature, room pressure, and that is your target. So what we do is we just change this continuous variables and to make, uh, to find out particular Hamiltonian, and such Hamiltonian will have a property, uh, sort of approach to your target property. All right. So that is that is a particular optimization problem. All right. But we do that through a continuous Hamiltonian, which nobody has done that before. So that's a, that is a inverse molecular design. All right, so first we, you know, this is sort of work that we did, uh, I did, uh, sort of participated when I was a PhD student. So the first demonstration of the inverse design was, do, uh, was a dumb at the density functional theory, which is the modern uh, sort of state of art of uh, uh, quantum chemistry. And then I come up with the formula to, for the tie binding framework. Uh, so tie binding is not a, a sort of version for uh, a, um, quantum chemistry calculation, but it's going to do it much faster. Okay, do it much faster compared to DFT. So I contributed a formula how to do it for using these uh, inverse molecular design method, and then we actually test out first for non to, for designing nonlinear optics. You know, so we say the idea is so cool. Let's see if we can do anything really uh, good. It can make something happen real. So the first thing we tried is nonlinear optics. So basically, nonlinear optics. What it happen is when you have a light, you know, shine on um, a p particular material. If this is a nonlinear optical material, it's going to convert. You're going to convert. Take two photons. Right? In a light, there's a lot of photons. So this particular material will take two of those photons and then combine those one photon and then and release a, a, a one particular photon. Right? The point is, you have some kind of uh, red color, two red color light, and then when you pass through the nonlinear, you're going to turn blue because it, it, it add up the two frequencies. All right, so that is a nonlinear optical material. And such a nonlinear optical material has been used, you know, like a radar, bioimaging, it's very useful stuff. Okay, people are looking for that material. If you want to, you've come up something uh, really great uh, with a very high nonlinear optical property you're going to be rich, right? Uh, seriously. So if you want to do some research on that area, um, let me know. Um, okay, so what we, how do we apply this? So first, I mean, I demonstrated sort of 10 frameworks. And this is the sort of, like, let's look at the lar largest one here. And saying we're going to uh, have, a, you know, pi conjugated rain here. Uh, we're going to change this atom, so kind of change its carbon to say nitrogen, phosphorus, they still keep their aromacity uh, and then they're still makeable, all right? And then we're going to see uh, what molecule eventually will come out would have the best nonlinear optical property. Um, so, so eventually, you know, just look at the side here. This is the nonlinear optical property. And we find out all the molecule that with the highest nonlinear opti optical property was, is actually has a asymmetry structure. So for example, you have all, mostly carbon here, suddenly you have a lot of nitrogen here. And here, if you cut it uh, between here or anywhere, you see they have an asymmetry structure. All right? So this is a consistent with so many years development of nonlinear optical field. And they actually find out that is true. 
All right. So our optimization actually point to that direction as well. All right. And the sec also we try with a linear optical property, which is something just uh, for like a UVVS absorption. So it's a linear property. And for the linear property, supposedly you're going to see symmetry structure. And we've, we indeed find out if you have a symmetry structure, you have the best linear optical property. So that is a demonstration saying our algorithm is actually working because our sort of final product, we propose the uh, product actually consistent with knowledge. Now, the second is we look at these uh, inverse molecular design because we're looking for the gradient. You know, like Joe uh, may know this, when you, uh, when you de uh, define a gradient, your surface must be smooth. All right? If you have a very rocky surface, then your gradient is probably not well defined. So we look at our surface, you know, basically change the structure, and you look at the opti nonlinear optical properties, and you look at this surface is really smooth. If, you, if I started with any point, I look at, I follow the gradient, and I can easily converge to a certain corner right here. So that corner represents a particular structure. All right, so that is proving uh, for the mathematical foundation, this is something um, rationale. And the third is we actually try uh, optimizing different properties. We have nonlinear optical, optical, uh, linear optical, we have a sort of a band gap, we're also looking at the uh, transition dipole moment. And we see that when you increase the size of your library, so say I, I'm going to search molecules along uh, 1 million possible versus 10 to the ninth uh, possible molecules. When, it when I increase the size of the possible library, and I'm going to see the efficiency going to increase. All right, so that is a very good uh, information. All right, so I think that is uh, the sort of the, the, this proof of principle. This is really working. And then I moved to Yale, and then we, uh, my, my advisor gave me a challenge problem. So they say, OK, we have a catalyst here. And this photocatalyst can convert sort of uh, 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 a propanol to, um, I think, is a ketone. And then it's not doing water oxidation. Uh, but then they put this sort of uh, organic metallic catalyst on top of this TLO2. So this whole catalytic uh, reaction is going to be derived by light, which is fantastic, right? So you're going to use free uh, energy to do it. Now, the question is, this molecule is not absorbing too much light. So this, the efficiency of using this photon is very low. He, and he told me, can you sort of enhance the photoabsorption of this dye? It turns out, if you enhance the photoabsorption, it may seem to be easy. You change the color of dye, and then you may have a higher uh, enhance of your uh, photoabsorption. But that seems to be trivial. But in fact, it's not that trivial. Because the color is really coming from this area. and then if you, you change the photoabsorption, and you're going to change the electron flow capability from the dye to the TL2. All right? So and also, if you change this part of the structure, and then this whole thing is not going to be sticky to a TL2 anymore, and then this whole uh, photo-induced uh, reaction is not going to happen. So, so I, try, I made several trials. And in fact, in the first we have to we actually you know do a different formula in terms of uh, these uh, um, inverse molecular design. So eventually, I come on an idea of saying well, we're going to fix uh, this sticky part and keep it that functional group to stick to TL2. But in the meantime, we're going to allow this thinner ring. This is the smallest chromophore we can think of. We we'll just change the function uh, the carbons sort of uh, on the ring or adjacent to the ring and see what kind of new chromophore we can get out of, uh, which will have the maximum absorption to sunlight. And so we did the absorption, we did the optimization. You see, every time I see something like this, I'm really happy, because which means our al algorithm is working. Because your property is actually growing. Right? It's like a climbing a mountain, as I said, climbing a mountain to the property, and then we know the property is actually growing. Because if we do it at random, there's no guarantee it will grow every time. And so when we grow to here, we find out we have a new structure. It's called a pinot uh, agai. And this structure, is, nobody has made that before, even though it's a very small molecule. So uh, our collaborator, Bob Crabtree, is a great um, uh, inorganic uh, a person in uh, Yale. And he's a lab, uh, Lorraine. Uh, she said, we can make some structure uh, that uh, close to yours. So uh, sh what she did is she made, instead of uh, a pyron, so you have a pyron ring here. Uh, attached to that guy, she has a sort of fuse 
um, uh, six membrane here because it's easy to make. All right, and we consider that as a sort of a deriv derivative of our Lee chromophore. Okay, so she made that, and then she find out that this supposedly going to be improve the photoabsorption much uh, compared to the previous group, uh, the, the phenyl agai. And so first we actually did a calculation. We say uh, supposedly it should be true. So this is the calculation in solution for that new uh, molecule, and then this is the um, calculation when you put the molecule on the, on the surface of TL2 is a sort of a solid state absorption. And then she did an experiment and this is the in solution, so the experimental absorption. And also this is experimental, uh, the TL2 also experimental absorption. It's actually co it sort of matched pretty well with our prediction and also is a, is a big improvement. See, uh, here is black one is before we did the optimization. And then this uh, a rat one is after optimization. It pushed a little bit to the uh, UV vis, uh, to the uh, visible light regime. So I think that also it is sort of is the first case we use inverse design. We actually make those compounds and verify those compounds are true. Now we're going to use this methodology to come up with a new catalyst for biomass conversion, right? So to do so, you know, first we have to figure out what things we want to optimize. So if, and we go back to the mechanism of these uh, hydrogenation. So usually when you put a hydrogen, say, onto a particular catalyst, for example, copper, this is a copper, and then usually this hydrogen atom, like here is a hydrogen atom, will be split it, you know, have a diatomic uh, hydrogen atom uh, molecule and then split it into hydrogen atom. And this hydrogen atom will sit on the surface of the copper, and then when you have sort of biomass, like this is biomass model compound, original, you attach that to the surface, and this, this hydrogen is going to release, and they're going to attack this, uh, this uh, CO double bonds. All right? So the mechanism is an absorption, and then this absorbed hydrogen, active hydrogen, will attack the adsorbate, uh, the biomass molecule. All right, so now when I look at this, this is sort of something in the literature, and I, I think, you know, immediately it's saying, okay, if I can change the structure of the surface and allow the surface to release this hydrogen much easier, all right, then I probably have have a much more active surface, all right. So so that is very simple. And then I try it, and I say, let's uh, put this as the copper, and then you know this is all copper latex, and then we're going to have a hydrogen right here. Now we're going to allow this uh, copper to change, right? To change whatever, maybe ion, maybe uh, zinc, uh, maybe cobalt, whatever. And then eventually we want to see if the binding affinity is going to go down. All right. Now, the first option is, you know, you, you're going to realize this is a combinatorial problem. It's not going to be a very small uh, uh, library. It's going to be a big library if you really do it in a relatively big size. Because if you've had lattice, you've got probably, say, 25 atoms. Or, so I, uh, first I try only five atoms and just proof of concept see this is going to work. And in fact, I'm uh, optimized relatively small regime of the surface. Now, I have uh, one, two, three, four here, and then I have a one underneath. Um, and then the first option I tried is I put copper, nickel, and cobalt. All right, there's three different types of atoms. And then I do the optimization, and I find out the, uh, the so this is a binding affinity when, when this go up, which means binding affinity has, has the lowest magnitude because this is a negative value. And then here you have a 3.2, so that is the low, lowest magnitude. And we see that there's nothing better than pure copper. So if you dope nickel or cobalt, and you'll find out no matter how you optimize it, it pure copper is the best. Uh, keep in mind, though, in the literature, people believe the uh, copper is sort of the best biomass catalyst uh, in terms of transition metals. All right. OK. Now. I say, okay, why don't I dump some noble metals? So I dump some noble metals. I put ruthenium, uh, platinum into uh, palladium into these uh, optimization, and then I optimize it. It's very interesting. You see, uh, this is going to uh, grow and grow. In. Now it actually passed 3.2. It, it got to 2. Point, say um, seven something, and then I get a new uh, structure, which is a uh, ruthenium doped. Copper. So we're gonna, if you have two of the ruthenium uh, atoms here, and this will give you uh, lower 
binding affinity for the hydrogen atom. Supposedly, this is going to be more active uh, catalyst. Uh, in fact, people do find out, you know, in general, in knowledge, people know that ruthenium will have a be is a better uh, catalyst for hydrogenation, but not probably not for the biomass. We don't know yet. But I think this is sort of consistent with knowledge, but we have to test out. But this is really exciting because um, it actually showing now this using very simple optimization using this inverse molecular design, we can actually come up with a new catalyst. In fact, um, current sort of the progress is we're actually using uh, this copper, based on the copper, we come up with some transition metals and it's sort of a mixture of the transition metals. We find out that, that trend, the mixture of this new uh, multi-metallic catalyst is actually better than pure copper. So my point is we're actually using this methodology, I, I haven't showed a result here, uh, is we find a new type of trans, uh, multi-metallic transition metals which is better than copper and in fact we, we sent it out to our collaborators lab, they made it and they actually proved it is indeed better. Okay, But the point is we don't know, we don't yet know why because this is a, is, a, is a solid, we have to characterize the structure, we have to answer you know, what is the surface and etc. So, but that is a very exciting area we're moving to. Alright, so I mean, this inverse molecular design, you know, you may be interested to learn a little bit more. So for that purpose, we actually put up a, um, a server and we uh, de de sort of designed a Java interface. So through this interface, you can actually submit job uh, to our server, say you have your own design problem, you, you want to choose different atom types and etc. And then you can run a calculation and get the result. In the meantime, we have uh, also a tutorial on you know, what is inverse design. So this is, uh, you know, this is interface is already working, so you're linking to our server, you can do, run a calculation easily. Uh, but we are sort of trying to polish in this website. If you're interested to do some work on that area, please let me know as well. So I'll make conclusion. Um, so for the thermodynamics study, we have to prove, theoretically, it is feasible to decompose liquid under the global MIDAS condition, room temperature, room pressure, and green solvent. All right? So far, we haven't seen any heterogeneous catalysts fall into that area, and, and that is, should be the future goal for molecular designers in the field. Now, the second is we're actually using inverse molecular design. We actually come up with, you know, with a simple scheme, but it's working scheme to come up with a new biomass catalyst and actually showing this is working and we need to further understand what's going on. And hopefully also, you know, by my talk, you already seen three examples of this inverse molecular design method and hopefully you're going to convince this is something serious. All right. Okay, now the acknowledgement. <laughs> uh, this is, you know, the thing I really want to say, uh, I, I sort of feel proud the most, uh, is I got, we got a, a lot of talented students at the University of New Haven. I'm saying that sincerely because without them I cannot do all this work, right? So, um, and then we have uh, people um, sort of volunteer to do some, uh, like a research scientist in my lab. And we have a master's degree student majorly from computer science. I'm also looking for some people in the biology side as well. And you can look at all these uh, undergrads. It's very impressive. They, they are all moving on now. You, you know, Joe is at Brown. And I think Jason is moving to UConn. You have Matthew now is a, a graduate student at, at here. And Jessica is moving to pharmacy school uh, at University of um, uh, St. Jo St. Joseph. Yeah, I think that's a school. Um, and Jenna also moved into University of Bridgeport for some medical um, area. So, and we are fortunate to get some funding um, while well, you may need an internal support. We have some NSF subcontract. NSF, uh, well, this is Nancy's uh, uh, funding for the uh, major instrument. And NIH, we have some small business fund. We also recently won this uh, Peach Award uh, competing with people at Yale and uh, for the Connecticut State. So that's a lot of things, you know, we're doing, we're putting our names everywhere in this small uh, grounds, but it's in a very helpful way uh, to spread out our reputation in terms of the work we're doing here. Uh, we're using our current facility here to do the work, we're using the student here to do the work. I think we create opportunity for student to, for the uh, exponential, uh, exponential education. In the meantime, we're, we're helps, uh, helping uh, the whole school to raising our uh, research reputation. 
Okay, so uh, well, one thing, you know, I actually I gave the same talk um, a couple of weeks ago at Yale. They invited me back for the physical chemistry uh, club. Uh, all the faculties are there in physical chemistry. Um, and then I, I actually brag about them and uh, to, to them and say, um, using undergrad to do research is really great. It's probably somehow better than PhD student. The reason I give them an example. And I say, if you ask an undergrad, say, I want to make a nuclear bomb. And a student would say, oh, I'm busy this week. I got, you know, coursework to do, right? Maybe I can do it next week, right? But if you ask a PhD student, they're not going to think that the way. They're probably going to write plan A, B, C and tell you that this is not going to work, that it's not going to work, right? So, but I'm, I'm doing that jokingly, but uh, the main point is, uh, for the undergrad, you guys, the curiosity towards science is amazing. When you think something it's you like and you are actually act out you wanted to make it happen so I think that is the best quantity for you to get into science and then when you get into PhD I want you still keep that curiosity because the curiosity is a driving force for everything happen so um, and don't think that you are sort of undergrad you can do things uh, but you can do amazing things all right so we have some uh, so just in case we we'll tell you that we have some um, lab space uh, in case you wanted to join the group. Uh, we have some competition lab in the Orange Campus uh, just for desk, you know, uh, you can sit there to study. Uh, you know, uh, chemistry department, you know, where uh, my office is. And, and also we have, we put some computer clusters in the computer uh, data center. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.